And let me open with a word of prayer, and then we will get started. Father, we thank you for the great gift that you have given us in the Pentateuch. The knowledge that we have of who you are and what you have done in creation, and the fact that we are in your image, we are your creatures, and that we are the way we are now because we have betrayed you and broken that covenant. We pray that you would open our minds and hearts, lift us up, let us understand more of you and of ourselves as we move forward with the blessing of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Week two of the Pentateuch. I think I see a couple of new faces this week. If you need, to, if you want to go back and review, remember the videotapes of all of these lessons are online, as well as all of the PowerPoint presentations. So you can go online to our website, which is litchapala.org, and view any of the classes, either from this term or any of the previous two terms. So litchapala.org. Okay. Uh, maybe I should actually put that up there next week. This is the outline for our class on the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch, of course, being the first five books of the Old Testament. Last week we looked at an introduction to the Pentateuch, and one of the things I talked about last week is the question of authorship, mosaic authorship. And we talked some about the documentary hypothesis, the idea that scholars since the 19th century um, have proposed that somebody else wrote the Pentateuch, it's actually multiple authors, um, I'm not going to get into that today or next week as we talk about Genesis. Uh, well, probably, I, I may refer to it briefly as we go along, but I'm not going to deal with that in length because we dealt with it last time and also dealt with it under New Te Old Testament survey. Uh, but today we're going to talk about Genesis 1 to 11, the primeval prologue. I often call it the prehistoric prologue because that's what primeval means, prehistoric. The problem is that when I say prehistoric, some people start picturing dinosaurs. All prehistoric means is that before they were writing history down. You know, before history existed in any kind of written form. So today we're going to talk about that. And uh, next week, Genesis 12 to 50, the story of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And then one of Jacob's son, Joseph, is the largest single section of Genesis. Joseph was not a patriarch, but he was very significant in terms of the history of the Hebrew people. Then week four, we'll look at the first 18 chapters of Exodus, God's great deliverance and bringing the Hebrew people out of slavery in Egypt. And then week 5, Exodus 19 to 40, which is the delivery of the covenant at Sinai, the giving of the law at Mount Sinai through Moses. Week 6, we will look at Leviticus. Week 7, the book of Numbers. And week 8, we will spend the first hour dealing with Deuteronomy. And the final exam will be the second hour. Again, three quarters of the way or so through this class, I will give you a document that tells you everything you need to know for the final exam. It also will be the critical things I think you need to know from this class. You know, here's the stuff that's most important. And I encourage you, even if you're not taking this class for credit, meaning for a certificate or a degree, that you do study that material and you do hope, hopefully you'll take the test, even if you're not doing it for credit, because the test itself is a learning experience. There's no downside. You know, there's, it's not going to go on your permanent record, as we, we jokingly say. But it would be valuable to you. I try to create the tests in such a way that they themselves are learning experience, because they cause you to think through and make relationships and stuff like that. Um, and you know, with, I, I encourage you all to, to take part in that. Any questions about where we're going with this? Okay, and other details like the reading schedule, um, and, and if anybody needs to get one of the books for this class, the book is Encountering the Old Testament. If you bought a book last term, and you're thinking, oh, I already have that, you don't, because these books are new. This is the Old Testament from this series. There is a New Testament book that looks like this, but it's not. So if you'd like to get these books, um, there are 400 pesos for these, and then we have books for the other classes as well. It's an ex a really excellent book. I'd recommend it to you highly. So if you, if you want to pick that up, you can see me at the break. Um, okay, we're talking about the first five books of the Old Testament. The Hebrew name for it is Torah. That means law, but it's not law in the way we think about law. Instruction is a better word for it. It does include laws. Obviously, the Mosaic Law is given in the book of Exodus. But the Torah, the Hebrew word Torah, means more instruction, teaching from God about who we are, what's wrong with us, how God is related to his people, and how he expects us to live our lives. Uh, the Greek word that we use for the first five books is Pentateuch. Uh, penta, like pentagram or pentagon, means five. So the Pentateuch is, the, in Greek, the five books, or perhaps more accurately, the five-part book. Because all five of these books, 
traditional authorship is Moses. As we talked about last week, uh, there are scholars question that, whether Moses wrote these things. We, don't, we, we have no problem believing that perhaps Moses used some sources earlier than his life, or that there may have been um, anointed writers like Joshua or maybe even Ezra 900 years later who came in and edited some stuff, cleaned it up or added, for instance, we believe probably Joshua added the last part of Deuteronomy, which is the story of Moses' death. Um, it's possible that Moses got a prophetic vision of what his death was going to be like and put it in there, but it's more likely uh, and not problematic at all that that would have been added by Joshua or some other divinely anointed writer. Okay, So we don't have difficulty with that, but we do believe that uh, Moses was the predominant writer and that all of these are really one one document, the Pentateuch, the Torah, these five books as we have them as the first five, five books of our Old Testament or the first five books of the Hebrew Bible have always been seen as a group, as a block. In all likelihood the reason why they were divided up into five books is because of the simple practicality that there's only so much you can get on a scroll. And for most of the history of these, these writings they have been kept on scrolls. Well, you can only roll up so much stuff and still not tear it, not you know, mess it up, be, have it in any kind of practical use. Imagine if we had all five of these books and the, you, know, you, were a, you were a Jewish person uh, a thousand years ago and they were all on a scroll and you're going, okay, I need to find the ninth, you know, the fourth chapter of the ninth verse of Leviticus. <laughs> it's going to take me half a day. I've got to roll this sucker up you know, and unroll it. So that's one of the reasons why we have five books now. And these are the five books, of course. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Genesis is the story of the beginnings. Um, Genesis actually means beginnings or origins. From the creation of the universe through the origin of uh, God's people, um, first Adam and Eve, and then the Hebrew people, up to the time of the captivity or to the presence in Egypt, where the, the Israelites are in Egypt. The book of Exodus relates God's deliverance of Israel from Egypt and then the establishing of his covenant law at Mount Sinai. The book of Leviticus sets forth the details of the laws of worship, the laws of holiness. It's called Leviticus because it's the Levitical laws. The Levites were the, tr the tribe of priests, and so these were the laws that the priests were responsible for enforcing and maintaining. And then we have the book of Numbers. Numbers, the entire chapter, has to do with the wandering in the wilderness. Because of their lack of faith, God ordained that the Israelites would wander for 40 years in the wilderness until the entire male generation that had lacked faith in God about entering the promised land until that whole generation died off. The only exception to that was Joshua, Joshua and Caleb who did have faith in God. Joshua became a leader of the Israelites, but all other male adults had died over that 40 years and then the Israelites were allowed to enter the promised land. So Numbers is the story of that 40 years of wandering. And then Deuteronomy is, uh, literally means the second law, or the second giving of the law. And it gives the law to a new generation, all of these people that have grown up um, since the 40, year, the 40 years previous when the law had been given. It restates the law and has special emphasis in three sermons by Moses to the people before they enter the Promised Land. Okay, That's what we're dealing with in terms of Pentateuch. Today, we're talking about the book of Genesis. We believe, uh, I believe firmly that the traditional view of Moses as the author is sound. Um, we believe this was written about 1450 to 1400 BC. As we talked last week, the liberal, more liberal scholars who would say that this was written perhaps by Ezra in the 500s during the, the Babylonian captivity. Well, what that means is not only does it bring into question the veracity of the Pentateuch, but between the Pentateuch and Ezra, there are all these other prophets and writings most of which refer to the law of Moses, to, the, to the, uh, the giving of the Pentateuch, to the Torah, to Moses. And so what happens if you, if you believe that, then you have just unplugged the reliability of everything between Pentateuch and the Babylonian exile, which is basically the end of the Old Testament, close to it. Um, again, the theme of Genesis is beginnings of the universe, of the human race, of sin, how that's introduced to the world, and of the Jewish people. The purpose is to show that the Creator God is sovereign, that He loves His creation, and the outline, I'm going to talk about this in a minute, there's two main sections of Genesis, which is the uh, first 11 chapters form the primeval prologue, and the uh, chapters 11 through 50 is the story of the Hebrew people. At any time if you have any questions, stop me, raise your hand, okay, or yell at me if I'm not looking up. 
So this is the two main sections of Genesis, the book of beginnings or the book of origins. Um, Genesis 1 to 11, the primeval prologue, focuses on events more than people. There are people in there, obviously Adam and Eve and, uh, and um, Seth and Noah and various others. But the focus is on events that occur. And there are four great events that happen in the primeval prologue. There is creation in the first two chapters. Then the fall of humanity in chapters 3 to 5. The flood story in chapters 6 to 9. And then the table of nations and, and the tower of Babel. And those two go together. We'll talk about that in chapters 10 and 11. The uh, focus is on all of humanity that existed at that time. And it covers a period of years we don't know. Okay, some people claim they know, but they don't really, because we don't know. Um, we'll talk about that. And then next week we're going to talk about Genesis 12 to 50, in which the focus is not on events so much as on people, particularly Abraham and his descendants. Abraham, the promise made to Abraham, the first covenant God made to the Hebrew people in, in and through Abraham, and then his son Isaac, Isaac's son Jacob, and one of Jacob's son Joseph. And you'll notice that Joseph covers chapters 37 to 50, even though Joseph is not a patriarch, even though Joseph is not the line through which um, comes King David or Jesus or any of the really significant people in the, in the, down the line in terms of the heritage of the Jewish people. Uh, and yet Joseph is critically important for this story. So the focus is on the family of Abraham, and it covers a period of about 300 years. Those are the two big sections. Today... We're going to focus on the first section, but let me give you why Genesis is important. The key messages that we draw from the book of Genesis. Uh, three of these four that I'm about to give you have to do with the, the primeval prologue, the first 11 chapters. Okay? First, Genesis tells us that God created from nothing, or ex nihilo, um, that he created everything that is. The assumption, we're going to talk about this later, the assumption is that God existed. In the beginning, God. You know, you could put a period right there and there would be a, you know, an enormous amount of meaning there. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So God created without any sense of there having been anything present earlier. I'm going to do a little comparison shortly about the difference between the Genesis account and some of the other um, ancient Near Eastern creation myths, like the Enuma Elish and the uh, Atrahasis epic, and I'll mention the, the epic of Gilgamesh and a couple of others, but Genesis tells us that God is the creator God. That's the, most, the first key message. The second key message is that Genesis explains to us what is wrong with us. Most of you have heard me say that, that throughout history, anthropologists will tell you that, that pretty much every culture they've ever found will identify, first, that there are some sort of religious beliefs, and second, that there's something wrong with us. There is something broken, something missing, something absent. We have a sense of loss that is inherent in the human experience. Genesis tells us what that is. Genesis tells us what is wrong, why we're confused, broken, lost, self-destructive, unable to communicate well. Genesis explains that to us. The third point, and we're going to unwrap that a little bit as we go. The third point is that Genesis tells us there are consequences for disobedience and betrayal, especially a betrayal of God's love. When we turn against God, violate the relationship, uh, betray our uh, commitment to Him, there are consequences. And those consequences are not just the Garden of Eden. In fact, when we talk about the four events of the primeval prologue, some, some scholars say it's probably more accurate to say there are only two events in the primeval prologue in the first 11 chapters of Genesis. There's the creation, and then there's the fall. Because everything after the fall all the way through the first 11 chapters, whether you're talking about you know, Cain killing Abel, whether you're talking about Lamech um, having done damage to somebody and threatening anybody else that, that uh, bothers him, whether you're talking about the marriage of the sons of God to the daughters of men, which we'll talk about what that means a little bit, whether you're talking about the Tower of Babel, whether you're talking about the Flood, all of those are consequences of sin having come into the world. So to that extent, everything after the Garden of Eden is a consequence of sin having come into the world because of disobedience and betrayal of God, including the flood and the Tower of Babel and everything else. But we think in terms of, just for clarity, for outlining, of the four events, creation, fall, the flood, and the Table of Nations and Tower of Babel. If you don't know what Table of Nations means, you're going to find out in about an hour. Okay? And then fourth, 
of the key messages. Genesis tells us the story, and this is through chapters 12 to 50, tells us the story of God's call and blessing on the people of Israel, the children of Abraham, as a sign of his love for all humanity. The, uh, for all of the judgment that comes after the sin of the Garden of Eden, after the fall of humanity, the end of chapter 11 and the start of chapter 12 is where God begins to show, once again, his redemptive love and redemptive care by calling forth through Abraham, a special group of people that will be his envoys. Now, the promise to Abraham, and when it's restated as the covenant promise to, to Isaac and to Jacob, all the way down the line, when God says, I will bless you, Abraham, I will be your God, you will be my people, I will make of you a great nation, he says also, and all nations of the earth will be blessed through you. When he reestablishes the covenant with Isaac, he adds, and all nations of the earth will be blessed through you. When he reconfirms to Jacob, Isaac's son, all nations of the earth will be blessed through you. So from the end of chapter 11 through to the end of Genesis, well, all the Old Testament, all the way up to Jesus, God is, in effect, recommitting his love and redemptive work in humanity, even after the fall. So, whereas everything from the sin in the Garden of Eden to the end to, well, middle of chapter 11 of Genesis is a result of our failing, God comes back in starting at the end of chapter 11 and chapter 12 of Genesis and starts restating over and over and over again his covenant commitment to redeem us even though we don't deserve it. <coughs> we being humanity. Okay? Are you speaking, excuse me, when you say he's, the, the nations are blessed, Mm -hmm. uh, in, in Israel, are, are, um, what exactly are you saying there? Are you saying that uh, Jesus is the product of the covenant promised to Israel? Okay. The redemption that comes in Jesus Christ is a fulfillment of the promise that was made to Abraham. Okay, and that promise was restated all the way down through the history of the Old Testament, and uh, that's why Jesus is an is a descendant of Abraham. But you're not talking about universalism. No. Oh, you don't mean better than that. No. I'm not saying... It would sound... It would sound oh, okay. Yeah, that's, universalism would mean to suggest that I'm saying everybody gets saved. No. The offer of God's redemptive grace is available to everybody. Okay? Whether they receive it or not. You know, not everyone will be saved. But God has offered his redemptive grace to all nations. You know, Jesus died for the sake of the whole world although not all will accept that, and so not all will benefit from it, okay? If, I, that's, if that's what I'm sounding like, I appreciate that correction, you know, that, or that, that clarification. No, the, the, the promise, God's promise of redemptive care and love was offered to all nations. That does not mean all will receive it because not all will accept it, all right? Okay, now, very quickly, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but this is a uh, sort of from talking the book of Genesis, kind of the major parallels in world history. We do not know when Genesis started. You know, we do not know when creation happened. I'm going to talk about the different theories. People who, who say that, that Genesis, the creation of the world was between six and 10,000 years ago, I don't believe that. Okay, we'll talk about the different ideas. Uh, I don't think we know when the actual creation of the world does. God knows, and that's more important than us knowing. Um, so whenever it started, to give you an idea, Abraham was about 2100 BC, so he was about 4,000 years ago. And the story of Genesis then, you know, picking up with Abraham, which we will next week in chapter 12, uh, I say chapter 11, chapter 12, Abraham is introduced in principle at the end of, end of chapter 11, but then chapter 12 is where we really start telling his story, okay? To uh, Joseph's death, which is the end of the book of Genesis, is about 1805 B.C. And I should put circus in front of that. We don't know that for a fact, but we believe based upon the rest of the history that we have. Now, let me give you kind of a context for that. About 3700 B.C., you know, about 1600 years before Abraham, the wheel is invented, probably in Sumer, uh, city in Mesopotamia. I'm going to show you a map in a minute. Or a region in Mesopotamia. There was a city and a region. Um, the... Uh, European cattle are domesticated about 3500 BC. Most of the domesticated animals that we know in the world today came from this region. Most of the domesticated crops that we know of in the world today, with possible exception of corn, which was you know Mesoamerican, um, come from that region. Wheat and various other uh, things come from that this same area of the world within about a 
300 mile radius uh, of the Mesopotamia and the Holy Land. It's quite extraordinary. Last week I talked quite a bit about the fullness of time, about how extraordinary it is that Jesus came to this place at this time. Well, a lot of other things, like the invention of writing, the invention of the wheel, the invention of domesticated animals, the invention of domesticated crops, all of them are from the same area, earlier, obviously, in Jesus. Uh, pictographic writing developed in Sumer about 3200 BC. About 3100 BC, the first Egyptian pharaoh dynasties began, one of the first great civilizations. You know, civilizations grew up in this part of the Middle East, in China and in Mesoamerica, all very early on, but most of the culture as we understand it in the world today comes from this region because China was very isolated. The Mesoamerican cultures kind of died out. Yes? Uh, unless I miss it, how do we know dating back that far that the wheel was invented? In well, these are estimates. I, could, I should put circus in front of all of this. We do know, like the Egyptian pharaoh dynasties, we do have some documentation of that. That's how we know that the early pictographic writing existed, because pictographic writing, the most obvious uh, version of that would be hieroglyphics, which is right. what they used in Egypt. So mm -hmm. some of these, like the pictographic writing and the first Egyptian pharaoh dynasty, we know. We do know that when the pharaohs were around, there were wheels. Okay? And so we know it happened sometime before that. And in cattle uh, the same way? Same, same way. So the pieces of actual historical documentation, not written history the way we understand it, because that, that actually was invented by the Greeks, you know, uh, Herodotus. But the, um, and we have to be very careful because the ancient writings that we look at for historical information were not written as history the way we understand history. They had real prejudices. They had a bias when they, when they wrote down things like in Egypt. Um, and they, had, they didn't have a concern about keeping accurate track of facts for the sake of people in the future. You know, they had, they had political objectives or religious objectives or whatever. And if somebody else came into power, they were likely to say, I don't like the guy that came before me and wipe out every, every reference to him or her in some cases. Um, so, but we do have points of information that we, we can sort of use as uh, anchors and then pieces of information that we can develop around that. For instance, the fact that we know something about the first Egyptian pharaohic dynasties, and we know by that time there were uh, both domesticated animals and there was writing, and there was the wheel. So it came sometime earlier than that. The earliest suggestion of those things we have are from some of the ancient Mesopotamian uh, documents, which is why we think those things happened a little north and east of, of Egypt. I'll show you in a minute. <clears throat> Around 3000 BC, we have the Minoan Bronze Age on the island of Crete. You know, um, the Minoan, we're still learning a lot about that. That was discovered fairly late, but there apparently was a very rich culture um, in, on the island of Crete, the Minoan culture. And that's when Athens as a city was <coughs> 3000 BC, so 5,000 years ago. About 2670, the first of the Egyptian pyramids was built. About 2475 is when we believe uh, maize or corn was first domesticated in Central America. You know, maize is one of the very few major cereal crops that came from somewhere that wasn't the Middle East. And by the way, I refer to the Middle East. As we go along here, you will see, I sometimes use the initials A-N-E. That means ancient Near East. What, when you're talking ancient times, they called it the ancient Near East or scholars still call it the ancient Near East. That's the same as the Middle East. The difference is, when it, was, when it first started to be calling the ancient Near East, the focal point was Greece. And so it was pretty near. Later on, the, the focal point of civilization moved to Europe, and so it wasn't Near East anymore, it was the Middle East. It's the same place. Ancient Near East, Middle East, same thing. It just depends on where you stand and when you're talking about it. Okay? So don't get confused by that. We are talking about, when I say ancient Near East or A-N-E, it's the, what we consider the Middle Eastern area, Israel, Lebanon, Syria, etc. Okay? 2340 is the first major empire we're aware of, which is the Mesopotamian Empire under Sargon the Great. Then about 2000 BC, and you'll notice that right in here is about where Abraham falls. Uh, 2000 BC, Stonehenge is built in England, which gives you some idea. We think, of that's, wow, that's ancient, right? Uh, no, not really. You know, the, the civilization, as we think of civilization, in Europe, Britain and Western Europe, is, is 2,000 years behind this part of the world, the ancient Near East, okay? And then around 1800s BC, the rise of the Assyrian and Babylonian cultures, okay? Which was about the time that Joseph was around. 
That just, I just did this to give you kind of a perspective, you know, touch points so that you get a sense of what's happening in the world uh, around that time. Okay, now, this is, I don't need Jerry, I don't have my pointer. <laughs> this is supposed to have a pointer in it and it doesn't work, so um, I'll just do this. You can see Sumer here. This, you see Mesopotamia right there, shadow, okay? Mesopotamia means the land between the rivers. Sorry about that. Uh, it's between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, and you, as you look along the rivers, you'll see here, Ur. Um, Ur is one of the most ancient cities uh, in Mesopotamia. It was part, it was um, the Sumerian capital. Susa was the capital of the Persian Empire. That's where Esther takes place, for instance. Esther is in Susa. Uh, you get Babylon, where the Babylonian Empire came up. Up here you get Nineveh. Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. Assyrians were a little north of the Babylonians, but still a Mesopotamian area. Um, as you follow over, you get to the coast over here, you see Canaan over there on the water. Canaan was the area which would have been Israel, Lebanon, Syria, and then down here you can see at the bottom left hand corner, Egypt. The green arc here, and actually it's probably more accurate if that arc continued on over into Egypt and down the Nile, is the Fertile Crescent. There obviously, when you get down to the Arabian Desert, when you get up here into what would be Iraq and Iran today, which is uh, east of Babylonia, well Babylonia and east of there, you get desert areas. But because of the river systems, the, Meso of the Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers, all of this was fertile. This is why they had wild grains, like wild rices and wild um, uh, wheat growing, and that they could domesticate. This is why there were animals there they could domesticate. This is where farming was invented. All of this thing happened here because it was, this was a fertile region. Um, I'm gonna come back to this map a couple of times uh, later. By then I'll have a chance at the break to go in and get my pointer. <laughs> okay. um, all right, any questions about that? Um, I don't know, well, don't think you can find it. It's wrong. Is uh, Ur and uh, in, that, in that area thought to be perhaps the Garden of Eden? Well, you will notice. <laughs> this says Garden of Eden, question mark. Okay. Um, yeah. I don't think it is, but that's a traditional place. I ha There's actually a theory which I think has some merit that I will talk about later about where the Garden of Eden was. The, the description in the Bible of where the Garden of Eden was, Garden of Eden was is so specific. You know, the headwaters of four rivers that we ought to be able to find it, but we can't, because two of those rivers don't exist anymore. One of them, which is traditionally understood to be the Tigris River, is actually called the uh, uh, Hidela River. Um, I'll show you a, a different map later, okay? Let's talk about the primeval prologue, Genesis 1 to 11. Creation, first two chapters. The fall, chapters three through five. The flood, chapters six to nine and the Table of Nations and the Tower of Babel, chapters 10 and 11. All right, let's jump into it. The first part of this I want to talk about, the first great event, is creation. Genesis 1. Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the darkness day, and the uh, God called the light day, and the darkness He called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. Okay, we could spend the next year on that. <laughs> so we're going to have to, you know, do fairly uh, cursory. One of the things that you might find interesting, you'll notice there was evening, there was morning, the first day. The Jewish people have always counted the day as being from evening. The day starts at night, and then goes through evening of the next day. So uh, when it gets dark, basically 6 o'clock or when it gets dark is when the day starts. That's the start of the next day. And so when it says, and there was evening and there was morning, that's the Jewish way of, of counting a day. Now, um, there are a number of different topics I want to deal with here. First, and I, I was speaking to Suzanne about this before class, the issue of the Trinity. I wasn't planning on talking about this, but I'll just throw this in there. The first evidence we have in Scripture of there being a trinity is right here, in this passage. Because you have God, you have the Spirit of God hovering over the waters, and then you have, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. John 1, the first chapter of the Gospel of John, tells us, calls Jesus the Word. And through Him all things were made, without Him nothing was made that has been made. 
that Jesus is the part of the Godhead that was responsible for creation. Well, God said, God spoke the word, fiat, to create by speaking. Um, and so you have here the presence of God the Father, you have the word which is spoken by God the Father, that is the second person of the, of the Trinity, and you have the Spirit of God. It's interesting that here, the reference to God in this first uh, chapter and elsewhere in the Old Testament is Elohim, which is the Hebrew word that is the generic word for God. And it's a plural word. So the generic name for God, there he has a proper name, which is Yahweh, which is used in the second chapter, starting in the second chapter of Genesis, but is formally introduced to us when Moses meets God. And, and Moses says, well, if the Israelites ask me who you are, what name do I give them? And God said, tell them that I am Yahweh, I am who I am. But both of these references to God, the Elohim, which is the more generic name for God, and Yahweh, the proper name of God, are both used in the first two chapters of Genesis and then throughout the rest of the Bible. But you get that idea there that God is a plurality. He is three in one. He is three persons in one God, the Trinity, even from the first chapter of Genesis. Okay? I could go on at great length on that. I'm not going to. But let me talk about five points I want to talk about related to this creation act. The five things are I want to talk about some of the differences between Genesis and other ancient Near Eastern, A-N-E. You'll see A-N-E in documents. You see strange things in documents. I, <laughs> I was reading an article about the Pentateuch, and the guy kept referring to recent history kind of things um, in New Testament times. And he kept referring to, like, you know, in 763 AUC. And I'm going, AUC? What, what is that? It's not AD or BC or, you know, BCE or CE. Common era. What's that? Common Era, I see that. CE, yeah, the Common Era. People who don't like the idea of Jesus being the center point of history have started using CE, which is Common Era, and, and BCE is before Common Era. Scholarly, that's all they use now. Yeah. They don't use AD and... Uh, I do, but they you don't. Know. <laughs> uh, AUC means how many years since the founding of Rome. Oh. This whole article is like 60 pages. He kept referring to dates, AUC. I had to look it up. I didn't, and I'm thinking, what kind of fool would do an article, a scholarly article and use the number of years since the founding of Rome? I'm sorry, but I have no reference point for that with regard to any other events in history. So, Okay, just my opinion. But, but people do do strange things. You will see now more often in scholarly articles instead of B.C., before Christ, and A, uh, A.D., Anno Domini is literally what it means. People say after death, that's not what it means. It's Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. Today, scholars who don't want to seem prejudiced toward Christianity use BCE instead of BC, which means before the Common Era, and CE, the Common Era. All right? So don't, that's what that means when you run across it. All right. Second point I want to talk about, and we're going to deal with these one at a time, but I'm going to give you the list. The relationship of verse 1 of Genesis to the rest of the text, because there are some questions about that. Third, the question of, are there two different creation stories? I talked about this a little bit last week. I'll address it a little bit today. Fourth, the literary structure of Genesis, which is linked to the Toledot expression or formula. Toledot means the generations of, or the accounts of, or sometimes some translations say the families of. Um, we'll talk about that. And then five, fifth, the interpretive options for creation, especially the meaning of yom, which is day. Carolyn caught me because when I put this stuff together, I had tov in there, which means good. And she said, isn't, isn't tov good? And I went, oh, yeah. She See, was I right. read Hebrew. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I read the book. <laughs> so, anyway, I don't, know even, I don't even know how I made that mistake, but she caught it, and we fixed it. So, okay, there we are. See, I confessed. Thank you. Uh, made a <laughs> Let's talk about these one at a time. Genesis versus other ancient Near East creation myths. There are other ancient Near East creation myths, which are even more ancient in some cases than the Genesis story. I'll give you a story of two of them. One is slightly less old in terms of the oldest versions we have of it. It's likely there were versions earlier than this. And one is older than Genesis. The, one of the best known is called the Enuma Elish which is, uh, these are all ancient Mesopotamian, especially Babylonian uh, documents. Um, Enuma Elish in the Akkadian language or the Babylonian language means when on high. It's the first three words of the, or first two words, I guess, Enuma Elish, of the document, which is 
This part of the world, ancient Canaan, uh, the Israelites, everybody, they would use the first words of document as the title. So when on high. This story, I've got an abbreviation here for you, uh, but I'll give you a little bit more than that. The Enuma Elish starts out with two gods. There's Apsu and Tiamat. They are the god and goddess. You know, it's male and female, kind of. Which is always the case in these stories. There's always male and female gods, and they're always procreating, and they're always fighting, and all kinds of stuff. Well, Apsu and Tiamat are the gods of the waters. Apsu is the god of fresh water. Tiamat is the god of salt water. Well, they have baby gods, and those gods have gods, and those gods have gods, and those gods have gods. They get down like five generations, and these young gods are making so much noise that Apsu can't sleep. All right? So he gets mad and decides he's going to destroy all of these junior gods because they're messing up his sleep. Um, well, the other gods hear about it. And like the fifth generation down from Apsu and Tiamat is a god called A, E A. Well, A decides to, um, to fight back and sneaks up and kills Apsu. So the male of the ancient head gods is dead. Tiamat immediately remarries a god named Kingu. Tiamat is so angry that her first husband was killed that she gets her sort of passive new husband, Kingu, to agree that they're going to kill all of the junior gods now in retribution. When the junior gods hear about that, they need a champion. And a couple of the gods try to fight Tiamat and aren't successful. And so finally they elect Marduk, who is the, one of the sons gods. These are all gods now. One of the sons of, e, of A. And he proves to be quite capable, so they send him after her. He uh, uses the winds as, as uh, weapons and blows a wind down Tiamat's throat and paralyzes her and shoots an arrow into her heart and kills her. He then tears her in two. Now, the world doesn't exist yet. <coughs> tears her in two, and half of her becomes the sky and half of her becomes the uh, earth. And But then all the other gods are saying, well, you know, and they make... Marduk, who became the god of Babylon, by the way. He was the chief of the Babylonian uh, pantheon. Um, they make Marduk the chief god, and Marduk gives them all homes and, you know, all sorts of things. And then also the gods say, by the way, Marduk, since you're so good, we're getting tired of all this work we have to do. And it, there's nobody else to do it. You know, you gotta do some, somebody's got to do this stuff. And so Marduk takes Kingu and kills him and uses his blood to create, or actually Ea does it for Marduk, uh, Kingu's blood to create human slaves so that the slaves do the work for God so they can just lay around all day and feel divine about stuff. Okay? That is the Enuma Elish. 12th century. Okay? Um, I'm going to talk about some of the elements of that and particularly how Genesis differs in a minute, which is the critical part. Another uh, ancient epic is called the Atrahasis. Atrahasis is actually one of the characters in here, and Atrahasis means exceedingly wise. This is actually older, probably by 600 years, than the, uh, the Enuma Elish. In it, three of the gods, Anu, Enlil, and Enki, the gods of sky, wind, and water, create a bunch of minor gods to do all the work for them. But those gods get tired, and they decide that they're going to go on strike, and they won't do any more work. Well, rather than punish them, Enki, who is the nicer of the gods, Enlil is the, is the mean one, Enki decides that he will create humans, not gods, but other beings, who can do all the work so that the, the, you know, the junior gods don't have to be upset about stuff and won't rebel anymore. Well, they get the mother goddess, Mammy, which I think is very funny because Mammy is what they call my maternal grandmother, Mammy. Well, Mammy makes humans out of clay and the flesh and blood of, blood of the slain god, Gestu E. Humans, though, start procreating, and they overpopulate. And so the gods, Enlil especially, sends uh, plagues, famine, disease, and drought to limit the humans, to, to uh, cull the, the herd of the humans, because there are going to be too many of them, finally decides that, and he does that every 1,200 years, he sends some major disaster to cull the, cull the humans. Finally, the gods decide that they're going to wipe out all the humans because they're out of control, and so they're going to send a flood. The flood, as it's being prepared, Ea, the, one of the same gods that was in the, the, in the Middle East, these are from the same region, remember, warns a human hero who, who's called Atrahasis, exceedingly wise, 
that this is coming and tells him he better do something, so he builds a boat. And he takes his family and his friends and animals on board the boat. There is a seven-day flood, pretty paltry when you compare that to the 300 days of you know, uh, Noah, um, 150 days of building up and 150 days of receding. And so they go on board the boat, and they survive, and they come out, and they have a sacrifice, and the gods who come have realized that they had made a fundamental error, and that is that unless the people are sacrificing to the gods, the gods don't have anything to eat, because they eat the food of the, that's sacrificed. And so the gods are starving, because the humans are all, all almost all gone. So Atrahasis, when he has this sacrifice, the gods all get come to the barbecue, and they're all eating and everything. And Atrahasis eventually is, is given immortality, uh, and becomes just the hero of the story. Now, there are similarities both in the creation uh, of Genesis, and also the flood story. The, the epic of Gilgamesh, you might also have heard of, is related to this uh, Atrahasis epic. It uses some of the same characters, although they have different names. And it is a flood story. Okay, now. <laughs> Disaster! Excuse me. Um, liberal scholars have, since the finding of these things, and this is almost all found since the, uh, the start of the 20th century, like the 1920s is when they found the Enuma Elish. They've said, oh, well, these things existed before, and, and the writer of Genesis just copied this stuff. Okay, it's just, they just, you know, this is a rerun of these, and it's just the same stuff. There's not, you know, Genesis is not original, it's not ordained by God, it was not given as a, as a you know, as a divine revelation or anything else. But I want to talk a little bit about some of the basic differences, and the important part between these, like the Enuma Elish and the Atrahasis Epic and the Epic of Gilgamesh and some of the other ancient Near Eastern creation and flood myths, is not the similarities, but the differences. That's the most important part. For instance, Genesis, different than any of the other ancient Near Eastern uh, creation or flood myths, Genesis assumes the existence of God. There is no theogony. A theogony is a story of how the gods came to be. Cosmogony is a story of how the cosmos or the universe came to be. Okay? So theogony means the story of how the gods came to be. Every other creation myth, especially the ancient Near Eastern creation myths. Uh, there are, by the way, there's, there's Asian creation myths, there's a Meso, there's, there are Mesoamerican creation myths, the Aztecs and others. All of them, pretty much, start with trying to explain where the gods came from. And the gods came from somewhere. Genesis is unique in that it, it assumes the existence of an all-powerful God. In the beginning, God created. Not in the beginning, there was this primordial chaos, and out of that chaos, God came. No. There is no effort to explain God. The assumption is he has always existed. That is a critical difference. All the others believe the gods are created beings in one way or another. Genesis does not. Okay. Secondly, Genesis is the only one that is strictly monotheistic. There is only one God. There's not Apsu and Tiamat and five generations to Ea and the sixth generation Marduk and, you know... Uh, Inlil and Inki and Apu and all these other gods. Male and female and procreating and all that stuff. Monotheism is absolute here. There is one God who made everything. A, a third important difference is that in Genesis, God creates effortlessly. God said, let there be light, and there was light. It's called creation by fiat, meaning you just say it and it is so. And he creates from nothing because nothing previously existed. Now, that's important because every other creation myth says there were the waters. Remember, the first two gods in the Enuma Elish, Apu and Tiamat, were the gods of the waters. The waters were already there. In almost every case, there is this chaos that exists, and the, it's hard for the gods. Instead of Genesis, where God created effortlessly just by saying so, in almost every case, there's a struggle. And the gods are struggling against each other, and they're struggling against the chaos, and they're struggling against all of the primordial materials that are existing, and it's really hard work. That's not at all the picture that we have in Genesis. It was an effortless ex nihilo creation by God. And fourthly, related to that, in Genesis, creation is good rather than chaotic. There is always a sense in which what is created in the other, other myths is somehow... Less than, less than the best. 
It's, it's almost like it's unfortunate that the gods had to do this, but Tiamat, you know, when Marduk tore her into, she turned into the sky and the earth. Tar, you know? Um, so creation is good in Genesis, it is not in the others, and humanity in every other case is created as a slave force, or is created as a, as a in some cases, um, an unfortunate side effect of something. Whereas in Genesis, humanity is the crowning glory of all creation. It is God's greatest achievement, and the thing he seems to be most proud of is having made humanity in his own image. The fundamental differences that exist are more important theologically than the similarities. It is more likely, in my mind, and not just my mind, but other scholars, but I believe, that there may have, there were these sort of free-floating <clears throat> mythologies about creation that existed in the uh, ancient Near East. And if anything, the, Moses, we believe, the, uh, and it was probably somebody before Moses, uh, a was inspired by God in the oral histories to keep track of this, and then Moses captured it and wrote it down for us as God, God the Holy Spirit directed him, that the book of Genesis may be using some of the kind of raw material of some of those stories, but the point of it is, as a corrective, you guys got it wrong. The Enuma Elish is not how it really happened. Yes, there was a creation that happened. Yes, there was a flood that happened. You know, the various pieces of this. But this is how it really was. And God the Holy Spirit anointed the, the writer, we believe Moses, but whoever it was that captured this as oral history earlier, to get the right story of how God, the one true God, created. Without struggle, without frustration, without multiple gods being involved, without uh, the need to explain where God himself came from. So I believe Genesis may very well have been aware, the writer of Genesis may very well have been aware of the other creation myths that existed, but that Genesis was a corrective to those, because the differences are very critically important. Question about that or comment? Does that make sense to you? John? Uh, going back to this BCE and CE, did you say <laughs> before the common era Yes. Or era? CE is common era. Era. Okay. And BCE is before common era. And almost all scholars now use that. Very few use AD and BC anymore. Yes? You had a timeline earlier on uh, events in the world history, like number one, uh, 3700 was wheel invented. Yes. Where did Adam and Eve fit in on that schedule? Well, we don't know. Look above that. I mean, um, I've got, we do not have a time for Adam and Eve. I mean, we're we looking at 4,000 BC, plus or minus? I don't believe so. No, I believe it's millions of years ago. <laughs> um, and we'll talk about that. Okay. I, I am not a young Earth creationist. I don't believe the world was created between six and 10,000 years ago. I don't think we have to in order to believe that creation was real. That's at the top here. I've got Genesis, question mark, question mark. And then the first date that we do have fairly accurately is Abraham at 2100 BC. Okay. I'll talk about the different theories for how creation may have occurred in a minute, okay? Let me get back down here. Um, any question about this or comment? It does, we do not do service to God or ourselves or our witness when we just deny that there are things like the Enuma Elish and the Gilgamesh epic and the Aprahasis epic and just sort of go do. I think we, you know, they're real. And we need to be aware of them and to take into account how it is we believe those things exist, and the story of Genesis exists, and why we believe our story is true, Genesis' story is true, and the others are not. And to me, there is a gravitas, you know that word? Gravitas, a seriousness, a, um, a give me another synonym for that, uh, to, to the Genesis story that does not exist in any of the others. When you've got, you know, God's wanting to destroy each other because you're interrupting their sleep, or you know, tearing each other in two to make the sky and the earth, or, you know, uh, the God starving to death because they forgot that when they tried to destroy all humanity with flood, they didn't have anything to eat if nobody was sacrificing anything. There are pieces like that that you go, there is a, even if we don't understand all of it, you read the book of Genesis and there's a sense in which there is a, a seriousness and a, a solidness, a weight. a weight, a ring of truth to that, that you don't read in the others. 
basic common yeah. sense. Basic common sense. Yes, Suzanne? But they're also called myths. When did they start to call them myths? Well, the definition of myth, <laughs> uh, C.S. Lewis writes quite a bit about that. C.S. Lewis, people think he was the writer of the Chronicles of Narnia or New Christianity. Yeah, he actually was a medieval scholar, you know, uh, medieval literature. And so mythology is something he dealt with a lot. And he makes a very, a very serious point that a myth, the definition of myth does not mean it's false. A myth is a great story that has behind it a higher meaning from which we are supposed to draw a greater level of understanding than what is on the surface of the story. So a myth carries with it a great moral, a great, a great um, something that we can uh, base our lives on even. You know, so myths are stories that have more significant meaning behind them than what's on the surface. Whether they're true or not doesn't matter. There are true myths and there are false myths. And in that regard, C.S. Lewis would say, Genesis absolutely is a myth. You know, the creation story, the Garden of Eden, are myths. That doesn't mean they're false. They could be true myths. But the point is, and this is the, this is the important exegetical point here, the reason for the creation story being given the way it is, is because what it, what it means to us. It's, it wasn't written as a science book. You know, it wasn't written as a scientific declaration. In fact, uh, I've read a lot about the fact that the book of Genesis in all four of the main events they talk about, including creation, they were addressing the expectations of people 3,500 years ago. They didn't care about scientific explanations the way we think about them. That's not to say that they didn't have concern about, you know, if you plant seeds, here's how they grow and all that. I mean, they had science. But their concern was for an understanding of the meaning behind stuff. And so the writing of the first 11 chapters of Genesis especially is giving us explanations, myths, if you will, that tell us the larger sense of why and how, not in its scientific detail, but in larger things, in larger, because that's what people were looking for back then. It's a very modern idea that people will argue about, well, how do you have plants on day three and you don't have the sun until day four? That would never have occurred to somebody when this was first written. Because that's not the way they thought. It's not the expectation they had. They looked at it and went, that's not what this is for. Why are you asking that silly question? And sometimes I think that needs to be our answer too. That's not why this was written. It wasn't written for us to use it as a science book. Okay? So, I think it is a myth. That doesn't mean I don't think it's true. Now, the extent to which it is literally true, I don't know. We'll talk about that a little bit. Okay? Right. Let's talk about now the relationship of verse 1 to the rest of the text. And again, some of what I'm giving you is a, a quick basis for understanding the kind of discussions and even arguments that occur. There is no part of the Bible that has been more analyzed or more, uh, more criticized, more, you know, more argument against than the Pentateuch, and probably no part of the Pentateuch more than the first 11 chapters of Genesis. Okay, so we're talking about the most controversial part of the Bible, maybe the most controversial part of any religious system right now. One of the things that people do is they look at the fact that there are legitimate alternative translations for the Hebrew of Genesis 1, 1 and 2. The Hebrew here is somewhat ambiguous. We typically interpret it or translate it like this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the earth was formless and empty, or, you know, void, sometimes, if you use the King James. That's how we usually translate it. The implication in that is that God's creative act is the absolute beginning, so that verse 1, which is in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, is sort of the summarizing heading over the following acts of creation in verses 2 and following. In other words, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, let's talk about how that happened. The earth was formless and void, and the Spirit of God was moving over the waters, and God said, Look, you see what I mean? That verse 1 ends up being sort of a heading over the creative act that kind of summarizes the whole thing for us. That's one way to interpret it. That's the way we typically uh, translated this. It is valid, however, and again, we have to be honest about this stuff, to translate this in a different way based upon the ambiguity of the Hebrew. We could read it this way. 
When, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was untamed and shapeless. That's another translation. Do you hear the difference in that? The first verse is no longer kind of the summarizing heading, and then we start getting into the details. The suggestion is that there is an indefinite time period, and that this is all kind of one act, or, another way to read that, the creation occurred somehow earlier, still the assumption being that God was the creator. But then Genesis, starting with Genesis 1-1, when in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was untamed and shapeless. Genesis is the process by which God brought order and meaning to the chaos. In other words, sometime before Genesis 1-1, God had created this mess, I mean this matter, and then Genesis 1-1 is where he comes in and he starts putting it in order. He starts taking the material and separating, you know, the waters above from the waters below, creating the seas, putting the animals in them, creating the dry land, putting the plants on it, you know, etc. But that the creation act somehow happened earlier. Now, why does that matter? So much of the argument of Genesis, is, or of all matters related to Genesis, the creation story at least, has to do with um, how is it that if you add up all of the years in the Old Testament, it looks like it was 6,000 to 10,000 years ago. And yet all evidence in science now says that it was in the millions of years that creation happened. Honest people have been trying, you know, for several hundred years now, to figure out some explanation for how both of those things would be true. That scripture really is the true word of God and that science seems to be telling us that's a whole lot older than six or seven or eight thousand years. Well, one of the ways is somebody has said, maybe we're reading this wrong. Maybe God actually created the earth materials earlier. And then Genesis is where he's coming in and putting it in order. I'm not defending that. I'm just letting you know that this is the kind of scholarly discussion that goes on. Um, the, the second translation comes from... Uh, I don't even know which version it is, but this is this is a legitimate translation. You know, you could translate the Hebrew that way. From you know? Hebrew, okay. Yeah. You know, um, what, sorry. Go ahead. One could read this, I mean, verse 1 and verse 2, and not find any conflict with the, with the idea that earth would be longer. He doesn't have to extend or invent something before verse 1 right. to look into this. I can't, I can't. I can't, <laughs> you know, to me, there's no conflict in, in, in reading these verses and seeing that, I mean, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, good. Now the earth was, was formless and empty. Right. For how long? Right. Nobody knows. I mean, so, who are these scholars? Well, to, well it is legitimate. This is a legit. there, there is well, a my legitimate question is ambiguity. ambiguity too. I mean, yeah. You know, it's, but there, there is an ambiguity in the Hebrew, and people are saying, well, you could translate it this way, but you could translate it that way, and that might have a different meaning. So it's the Hebrew that... Exactly. The question. Yeah. And, again, it's people who sincerely... I mean, it's not, this, is, this is not somebody trying to, to unplug the divine inspiration from it. It's people really struggling with what is the relationship between the first verse to the rest mm -hmm. of Genesis. And that's a legitimate question. I don't think it has any... You know, massive theological meaning either, but it is a legitimate question, okay? And given given the Hebrew that we have here now, the uh, oh, that was it. Thank you. Um, I want to go back. What? Well, I'm not going to do any more with that, other than that for you to know that I think the reason there are legitimate people who struggle with this is the question is, does this help give us an understanding of of what this is saying. Now let me give, I want to do a little bit more before we break. The idea of are there two creation stories? Some people read this and you go online and there are these skeptics places who say, oh there's two completely different creation stories and they're completely separate, you know, and one of them, well, they're not. Um, I did it again. There we go, I got it, I got it. I just have to push the other button. Genesis 1 says the heaven and the earth are created in six days. Genesis 2 then comes up, Genesis 2, 3 and on, says creation of man and woman uh, is the focus, no time element mentioned. Uh, Genesis 1 is man in his cosmic setting. Genesis 2 is man uh, as the central, as being central to God's purpose. Genesis 1 talks about the panorama of creation as a whole. Genesis 2 focuses on one aspect of creation, and I think that's a critical part of it. Genesis 1 deals with God creating the heavens and the earth. Genesis 2 focuses on man or humanity as the uh, crowning act of God's creation. 
People claim these are completely different. I don't believe they are. I believe if you read them, the first, Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 3, is, is the big umbrella part of it. You know, it's like, okay, here's the big story. Now, Genesis 2, 3b and following, focuses in on the most important part of that creation story, which is the creation of humanity. Now, if you read it, there are places where it says, you know, uh, and God created man, and all the animals, you know, were then um, available for humanity to uh, name, you know, for, for Adam to name. Some people say, well, that suggests that they created the animals after he created humanity, which is not consistent with the first chapter. It doesn't actually say that. It suggests that God had the animals in mind. He had, he had Adam in mind when he created the animals, and when he created the animals, he had in mind that he was going to ask Adam to name them. And so you see all of this sort of happening in the mind of God, not in a chronological sequence. And you have a creation of Adam and then the creation of Eve. I do not believe they are contradictory. I believe that they are very much um, in sync with one another. The second creation story, if you want to call it that, is simply a focusing in on the most important part, which is you know, the, the Adam and Eve part. Now, again, two creation stories. One of the things that you'll notice the way this is, this is uh, stacked up. One of, one of the reasons I don't believe this could possibly be the product of four or ten or twenty different sources and then redactors is that when you start looking at the Hebrew of these books, including Genesis, um, there is a very intentional structure. It's called a chiasm if it's less than four verses. If it's more than four, four verses, it's called a palistrophe, where it's like, it's like a tide. It's like you write it and, and you have a sequence of things that go out and then you come back again. And you hit the same things going out and coming back. The book of Daniel, the whole book is like that. It's, it's like it, it has this sequence in, in Hebrew and then the same sequence in Aramaic. Half of, <coughs> half of Daniel's in Aramaic and half of it's in, in Hebrew. In this case, if you follow this, the creation process is complete after the first chapter and the first three verses of the second chapter of Genesis. Heavens and earth are created, God has finished his work. And then he gets into the details. Second, uh, verses four to nine, uh, humanity is created, man is created, formed from the dust. And then trees and rivers in the garden are given names, verses nine to 14. Then uh, man is assigned the task of guarding and keeping the garden, verse 15. Then there is the story of the forbidden fruit, 2, 16 and 17. Then it backs up, and each verse that withdraws from the forbidden fruit hits a theme that's parallel to one earlier than that. For instance, man is in need of a helper, it's not good to be alone, is a parallel, the way it's written, to man being assigned the task of gardening and keeping garden. Then the animals in the garden are given names, like the trees and rivers in the garden have been given names. Then woman is created, formed from Maria, is parallel to man having been created, formed from the dust. And then the creation is complete, man and woman are naked, unshamed in the presence of God, is a parallel to the first three verses of chapter 2, the creation. And so you get, especially in the Hebrew language, you get a very clear sense that it, it works its way up, and then it works its way back again. What is it called? It's, and if it's less than four verses, it's called a chiasm, C-H-I-A-S-M. If it's more than four, four references, it's called a palistrophe. And there's a lot of structure in here. It certainly does not appear when you analyze the structure of the Hebrew language in the in Pentateuch, especially in Genesis, as though this was just slapped together from a whole bunch of different writers coming up with different pieces of it. And then, oh, back up. Okay, I've got something later on I want to refer to there. Um, so, I do not believe there are two creation stories. I believe there is one creation story and then one focusing in on a particular piece of it, which is the most important part of the creation of humanity. We're going to take a break. I mentioned the fact that there is, uh, there is structure within Hebrew, within the Hebrew of Genesis. There are uh, chiasms and uh, para, uh, palistrophes in terms of structure, but there's also a literary structure within Genesis that is based on a literary bridge called the, the Taladot form, uh, formula. Taladot is a Hebrew word that is, in some versions, is translated the generations of. These are the generations of. In some translations, it's uh, this is the account of. There are some translations that translate Taladot 
This is the family of, because in almost every case it's given as an introduction to uh, a genealogy or a description of families. Now, uh, there are ten different sections of Genesis, each of which is introduced or is bridged by the Bayai Toledot formula. Genesis 2.4 says, and this is the Toledot of the heavens and the earth, or the account of the heavens and the earth. Genesis 5.1, the Toledot of Adam. 6.9 of Noah, 10.1 of the sons of Noah, 11.10 uh, the Toledot, or the account or generations of Shem, of Terah, of Ishmael, of Isaac, twice of Esau, because there's a little, there's a little point in there, they say this is the Toledot of Esau, and they, then they say this is Esau who was the father of the Edomites because his name is also Edom, and then it's like they go, okay, now back where we were, this is the Toledot of Esau, so they, so they say that twice, and then the Toledot or generations of Jacob. So there's a very clear literary structure with each of the ten sections separated or bridged by these formulas. If you look in your Bible, it will read either the generations of, or the account of, or the family of, probably, in the English Bible. So there's a very specific kind of orientation, and in each case, it's related to the various genealogies or family lines that come. Okay? Now, so much of the arguments or discussions or debate or whatever you want to call it about um, Genesis have to do with how long the creation took and how long ago was it. One of the things that I think causes a lot of misunderstanding in that, and it's helpful for us to have a basis, is the interpretive options for creation, particularly because the word yom, which means day, okay, because <coughs> creation happened in six days and on the seventh day God rested. What is a day? And I'm going to give you in a few minutes, I'm going to talk about some of the different interpretive ideas about creation. Uh, and for the most part, they differ on what a day is. You know, the scripture says a day is as 10,000 years and 10,000 years a day to the Lord, right? Well, in Hebrew, yom, or day, can mean a 24-hour period of time. You know, from midnight to midnight in our case, or from the start of the evening to the end of the day, the next day for the Hebrews. It can also mean a period of daylight, like the daylight hours, the difference between day and night, for instance. As long as the sun is shining, is the day. It can also mean an extended period of time, like an era. Now, lest that seem too confusing to you, the same thing is still true in English. For instance, we could say, in my father's day, which is an era, a period of time, it took three days, 24-hour period, to drive across the state during the day, meaning during the daylight. We use the word day with very different meanings, the same way the Hebrews did. So, lest we be too confused by it, our language is just as complex in that regard. You know, I, we, Carol, uh, Carol and I had breakfast one time with a friend of ours, and she said, you know, I just found out that in Spanish, pero and pero are, you know, one means but and the other means dog. Why would they have the same word for two different words? And Carol and I are looking at each other like, really? Actually, they're not the same word. It's pero and perro. You know, there's two words in dog, pero. And we said there, there, and there. Okay, T H E I R T H E R E T H E Y P O S R E R E. Okay, our language is, well, we have the same frustrations with Hebrew and with Greek. Sometimes we're not clear what those words may mean. Okay, now, again, talking about the days of, days of creation. Okay, days, the yoms, uh, creation. Another chiasm that you need to be aware of day one is the giving of the light. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. But then on day four, and there's a reason why I'm skipping here, because this is a chiasm, on day four, God creates the sources for the light, the sun, the moon, and the stars. The in indication is that when God created light on day one, it was a radiance of light that did not have a particular source. He just made light evident in the universe. Day two, God separates the water above the firmament and the water below the firmament, the water of the sky versus the water of the, of the seas. But then on day five, he comes back and he puts the fish and the birds, the birds to fill the sky, the fish to fill the water, so the animals to occupy that. Day three, 
there is the creation of dry land and vegetation, and day six is the creation of land animals and man, the creatures that live on the land. And then, of course, there is day seven, the Sabbath rest. This is a chiasm. God creates light, and then water and sky, and then dry land, and then he comes back, and he creates the sources for light of day four, which is linked to the light of day one. Then he creates the animals to occupy the water and the sky. So day five is linked to day two. And then he creates the land animals and humanity to occupy the dry land, which is day six linked to day three. And then you have the day of rest. Again, there is very intentional kinds of structure built into the order of how this is written. It's not slapdash. It's not thrown together from a lot of different sources and reductors. I don't buy that. It is too intentional in how it's, how it's presented. Okay. Now let's talk about options, interpretive options for creation. How did creation occur? Science and most of the secular society, of course, says evolution is by natural selection. This is the Darwinian theory of natural selection, that there was originally a primordial ooze and amino acids got together and created one-celled animals who then sort of latched on each other to create multi-celled animals who created lizards that crawled out of the ooze, etc. Okay, that's evolution by natural selection, Darwinian evolution. That is what, not all by far, but, but most science and most of the secular world believes now. Then there is evolutionary creation or theistic evolution. The idea that yes, humanity may have developed evol an evolutionary process so that we are, um, you know, we are evolved from lower primates, but that none of it happened without God being involved. None of it occurred without God's intentionally causing it to occur. That's another theory. I'm giving you all of these first. There's six of them. A third day, which comes back, a uh, third option, I'm sorry, which comes back is the day-age view of creation, which, this is looking at the word yom in, you know, there was evening, there was morning, the first day, the second day, the third day. That the day is actually um, an era, a long period of time. This is because the word yom, or day, can be interpreted as a much longer period than 24 hours. And because there are other verses like, to the Lord, a day is as 10,000 years and 10,000 years a day. There's indications that a day is not the same thing to God as it is to us. And so some people believe that's how it happened. That God, was in, God did it, but that he did it with each of those days representing a very long period of time. Okay, then there is the literal day view, or young earth. Which means each day of the creation in Genesis 1 was a literal 24-hour day. And of course, the cynics or skeptics would say, how do you have a 24-hour day for the first three days when the sun wasn't invented until the fourth day? Um, there, there, is, there are arguments for this. For instance, later on when the law was given and, and through Moses we were told that the Sabbath day, you know, respect the Sabbath because in six days God, God created and so for six days you're supposed to work, on the seventh day God rested, on the seventh day you're supposed to rest. Well that parallel between, you know, we're supposed to work six days and rest one day because God did that, seemed to indicate that there may have been some connection between the days of creation and the days of work and rest for us. Okay? I'm being fair here. So those, but the thing is that if you take that approach, that means the world, the universe, is between six and ten thousand years old, depending upon how you count some of the Old Testament things. And that obviously creates a problem. In fact, from the very earliest days from, uh, of, the, of the Christian church, certainly as, or as early as the 400s, early 400s, uh, Augustine and others have said, stop saying things like that, people, because you make us sound like idiots. Because even then they didn't believe the world was only 6,000 years old, really. You make us sound like idiots, and nobody wants to accept Jesus if, he, if they think that all, other, all the followers of Jesus are idiots. So be careful about that kind of stuff. Is that a direct quote from Augustine? Well, <laughs> you know, Augustine said stuff pretty close to that. Augustine, you, you, read, you read Augustine, you know, he wrote the world's first autobiography, yeah. uh, The Confessions. And you read it, and it's like he wrote it a year ago, you know. Mm -hmm. It was Augustine who said, Lord, make me chaste, but not yet. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> Very contemporary kind of, of uh, thinking and writing. So, the literal uh, day view or the young earth view. Then there is the gap theory of creationism, which suggests, there's actually two, two aspects to this. 
Um, the gap theory literally says that God created in a day, but then there was a long gap between that day and the next day, and it was in that gap that various evolution occurred, and that explains why there's a longer period of time. There's also, um, related to that, is the idea that there may have been a very large gap between verse 1 and verse 2 of Genesis. The idea that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, he made all the raw stuff, and then there was this long period of time before he then came back and started organizing it, and some of that was, you know, that's, that, that, that's related actually to the ruin reconstruction view, that there's a long gap. Ruin reconstruction means that God created, and then perhaps because of the fall of Satan, you know, the angel Lucifer, and the rebellion of one-third of the angels, that there was a period in which creation itself was damaged. This is between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. And so God came back in after that ruin, and he reconstructed, and that's the version that we have in Genesis 1. Again, most of these are efforts to try to explain how we can believe, with the exception of number one, how we can believe in the story of creation as it exists in Genesis without looking like an idiot because the whole rest of the world, every scientist out there is saying, no, the world is not 6,000 years old. It's millions of years old. How can those two things both be true? Um, I think they can. But the point is we don't have to know how those things work. The thing we have to know is that God is God. There's only one of him, and he made everything that he is. How he did it, we don't really know. I'm perfectly comfortable with saying that. I have no problem saying that. When I try to, when I try to act like, or anybody tries to act like, they know everything, including how the, how the world was created, and they try to explain everything, not only does that end up looking cheesy, but it's actually rationalism. Rationalism is the idea that unless I can conceive of it with my mind and explain it, it can't be true. Well, people who try to say that I can explain everything about how the world was created and how long ago it was and I can, make, I can answer all those questions and put all that, that's Christian rationalism. As opposed to being able to say, I believe in God, I believe God made it all, I believe God is still in control of it. How exactly he did it, I'm not sure. I believe the book of Genesis is true. I believe the scientists are right. I don't think we were... The world was created 6,000 years ago. <clears throat> How those two things fit together, someday I'm looking forward to finding out. I don't know right now. And I'm okay with that. I think it's a sign of insecurity. Spiritual insecurity, as much as anything else, to feel like we have to answer every question about how the world was created. I don't think we have to do that. Comments on that or questions? Bob? I'm a Star Trek kind of guy. You're what? <laughs> I'm a Star Trek kind of guy. Okay. Let's think about this. God created the stars, right? Right. Okay. Well, the light from the stars, many of them have taken thousands of light years to get here. Right. So how do you fit that in? Well, that's why that's one of the reasons that I don't believe the world was created 6,000 years ago. There are stars far enough away from us. The light that we're seeing right now, we literally are looking back in time. We are seeing light that was generated by those stars tens of thousands, even millions of years ago. Because the light's just now reaching Earth from those stars. Well, how is that possible? And, and again, somebody who feels like they have to explain all that and say, hi, in 6,000 years, well, God created that light almost, it was almost to Earth already when God created it, okay? You don't have to go there. You really don't have to do that. I, I don't, my, there is more integrity and more intelligence demonstrated by saying I don't have all the answers than there is in trying to act like you do have all the answers. John? Um, that's why we as, as Western Christians don't like mystery. It, it just doesn't fit with us. Mm -hmm. Now these Orientals that, that wrote this and, and, and studied this, for them it was not difficult at all. But we've got to put everything in our, yeah. in our, in our boxes mm -hmm. and we're pragmatics. 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 Mm -hmm. we, we just don't handle mystery well. But, yeah. but that's part of it. it this, it's, it's a mystery. Right. The kingdom of God is a mystery. And you're right. And as I said earlier, the reason why this doesn't give scientific explanations is that that's not the point. That's not what it was written for. And when it was the people it was originally written for, mm -hmm. they, they had the good sense to know that's not the most important part anyway. You know, the most important part is having a sense of what, what's behind this. What's the meaning? Not what are the facts, but what's the meaning? What's the, 
What values do we take from this? And the values are the things we said earlier. There is a God. He is the only God. He made all that is. You know, He made us for a relationship. That relationship got broken. But God has made it possible for us to be back in a relationship. There's not one piece of science, hard science, anywhere in that. And yet those are the things that matter. Okay? And we, when we let somebody suck us into arguments about you know, 6,000 years ago or what, you know, whatever, then we're being fools. You know, we're, we're being forced to play on a field that's the wrong field. That's not what we stand for. That's not what we are supposed to represent. And people who believe that if you don't believe in six literal days of creation 6,000 years ago, you can't be a Christian, that's silly. That's absolutely silly. Okay. Not that I have an opinion about that. <laughs> okay, I have a lot of more stuff. Let's go to the second part of Genesis, the uh, brain movement prologue. The fall. This is where God who made humanity in His image, with relationship in, to Him, um, violated that trust. It starts um, Genesis 2.15, uh, just for a setting, and then the third chapter. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. That just gives us a setting. That's a context. And then we get to the third chapter. Now the serpent, no, introduce the serpent here. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will certainly, you, I'm sorry, you will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. See, this is Satan's first trick, is causing us to doubt what God has told us, even when we know what he's told us. He does it twice here. You will not certainly die, the servant said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. The point of this is that God gave us everything we needed and only put one boundary, one restriction on us. And because Satan got us to question whether God really said it or whether he really meant it, and caused us to believe that we could be something more than we were created to be, that we could be like God. We were not made to be like God in that way. We were made to be like God in other ways, in his image, but not to know good from evil. I don't know about you, but I think it would be great not to know evil, which was the situation in the garden. And yet, believing they would be somehow more powerful or more wise or more whatever, like God, Eve and then Adam, who's just sort of this doo -doo 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 guy going on here, whatever you say. <laughs> That's the sense that you get from it, and he ate too. Um, and so they violated the only rule that God had given them. And then this beautiful passage, picking up in verse 8. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Who doesn't love that? Yes. Okay. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden, but the Lord God called to man, where are you? Mm -hmm. I think there's real significance to this. This is an example of the fact that while God is all-powerful and all-seeing and all-knowing, he respects his creature enough not to use his power to spy on God walks in the garden in the cool of the day and calls out, where are you? Well, God had the power to know where they were, but he was respectful. He limited. It's consistent with the kenosis passage of Jesus in Philippians when it said, Jesus did not, did not uh, consider his divinity something to be grasped, but rather set it aside for our sakes. This gives us an image, I think, of God doing the same thing for Adam and Eve in the garden. He literally limited his own abilities, like he was, you know, he did this, in order to be respectful to his creatures. Okay. He called out, where are you? Yes? Um, could this also have uh, the meaning of, where are you in relationship to me? Because I know what you've done. Yeah, um, it could, but I think that I don't think it needs to. I think we get to that. I think this literally, you know, because it's talking about them hiding and him walking and saying, where are you? Um, I think that he gets into that, who told you you were naked in just a minute. Okay, it could mean that, but uh, um, I, I prefer to take the simpler route. Okay, Occam's razor. Simplest answer is the best one, right? Um, 
He answered, that is, Adam answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, that is, God said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not, not to eat from? Again, God could know this, but he's, he's calling on them to confess. The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. It's not my fault. It's your fault for putting her here, and it's her fault for giving it to me. Not my fault. Your fault, her fault, not my fault. Okay. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. Not my fault. Snake's fault. And implied in that is the fact that I think you made all these critters. Your snake. He did it. Okay. Your snake. Um, so the Lord God said to the serpent, this is the first of the judgments, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between her offspring, <coughs> uh, your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Ever wonder why you don't like snakes? <laughs> To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you. No excuses. You didn't have to. You chose. You must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the earth, since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. And one more passage I want us to read. Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. God has just said you're going to bear children in pain. You will give childbirth. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Okay. First thing God did after the declaration, the acknowledgement of the fall, was to give gifts to Adam and Eve. What were they? Oh, garments. Animal skin. Animals. Okay, garments made from animal skins. What does that mean? Sacrifice. Death entered in. The first fallout, besides shame, which they didn't have before. The first fallout after uh, the sin of the garden was death entered into creation. It was more than just Adam and Eve that fell. When sin entered the garden, all of creation was damaged. And the first result of that is animals died in order to provide covering for these creatures who now felt shamed. It wasn't because they were cold. It was because they were shamed, felt shame. Okay? And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard, to guard the way to the tree of life. The fall and the judgment. I still don't have my pointer. John, would you go and see if you can get it? There's a tray on the back of my desk, and it should be somewhere in that tray. It's a black, you know, sort of chubby thing. Yes? Um, in the original Hebrew, uh, it refers to uh, skin. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we know an animal died, and they saw death for the first time. Uh, do we have any sense of what that animal might have been? Could it have been a lamb? We don't. We Nothing. No, there's no indication. Nothing in Hebrew. No, it just says that you get the skin of animals. Okay. Um, yeah. Garments of skin, yeah. One of the questions where it says, he's made man and he's made us, he, he now knows good and evil like we do? Mm -hmm. or is right. That, okay. Referring to the Trinity? Well, th there's a couple of different ways you can read that. One would be that he's got us speaking to the Council of Heaven which the Council of Heaven has described that there were angels. And the angels obviously had the ability to know good from evil because some of them chose evil. Right. The, the, okay. Satan, the, the fall of one-third of the angels. Um, I, in, in almost every case where God refers to us, like let us make man in our own image, um, I prefer to see that. And scholars 
disagree on this. I think that that's a reference to the fact that there is an inherent plurality in God. You know, that He is God, is community within His own self. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He can legitimately say we, um, without it being pretension. Some people say that this is the we, this is the plurality of majesty. Again, like, like Queen Victoria. We are not amused. Okay? Um, it's possible, but I think it's more likely that it is that there is an inherent plurality in God. That's why Elohim, the generic word for God, is plural. And by the way, when we talk about you know um, the two creation stories, one of the reasons that people have thought it's two creation stories and two different sources is because chapter one uses Elohim as the word for God. It's the generic word for God. Chapter two, with the creation of humanity, you know, um, male and female. The word for God, the name for God, is Yahweh, the proper name of God. And so liberal scholars have said, well, obviously, the first one was the Elohist source. The second one is the Yahwist source because they use a different name for God. But since the first one is a generic, it's right on the back of the desk, John, toward the wall. You said a man to find it. That's okay, never mind. The, um, so the idea that the first chapter is the generic kind of, here's how the world was created, to use the generic name for God makes sense. The second chapter is dealing with the personal creation, which is, at, you know, which the beings that God made for relationship. Thank you very much, sir. I appreciate that. Sorry, it was so hard to find. Um, and so they use the personal name for God because he's talking about the creation of Adam and Eve and his relationship with them. That makes sense, I believe. Okay? You will notice... Again, this is the Fertile Crescent, this is Sumer, Babylon, this is the Tigris River, the Euphrates River, this is Mesopotamia, the area between the rivers, this is the Holy Land, or Canaan as it was originally called, so Israel would be here, Lebanon here, Syria, etc. This is Egypt, okay? Here, near Ur, is the most, the most widely accepted, probably, traditional idea of where the Garden of Eden would be. But there's a problem with that. The Bible says that it is at the headwaters of the four great rivers. The Pishon, the Gihon, the Hedela, and the, the Euphrates. Euphrates is the only one that we know for sure was there. Well, the headwaters is where a river starts, not where it ends. Okay? There is the theory, which I think is kind of cool. Um, are you all familiar with the Great Rift Valley? The Great Rift Valley is a geological you know, chasm. That, that goes through three continents. It starts, you know, up here, and the um, this is the Jordan River Valley. You know, the Dead Sea is at the lowest lowest place on Earth, the most natural place on Earth. It's over 1,200 feet below sea level. From the Sea of Galilee, the the uh, that whole Jordan River Valley and the Dead Sea, and the Red Sea, and all the way if you get down here to Africa, um, down into if you go to Kenya. You can, just south of Nairobi, you drive and you can drive out on this promontory and look out and there's this giant, it's like, like, you know, like God took his hand and just swept away an enormous trough of earth. That's part of the Great Rift Valley. It goes all the way down into Africa. Well, the idea is that the geographic cataclysm that caused the Great Rift Valley and caused the, the, uh, Jordan, the Jordan Valley here on the Dead Sea, that caused the Red Sea, that caused the Great Rift in, uh, in Ethiopia and uh, Kenya, all of that came after the creation, after Eden. You know, that happened later. And so there was a reorienting of all the rivers, for instance, probably at that point, because you have a major cataclysm like that, and rivers start flowing in different directions and things. So there's a theory that this is Eden, where Eden might have been, because before the Great Rift Valley, the reason there was a river that, that they believe, they've now found some indication, that would have run right down what's now the Red Sea. They have found an ancient river which cuts right across the northern <laughs> third of, the, uh, of Arabia. And they, there's no water there now, it's all desert. But they found the evidence that there used to be a major riverbed there. Um, the Tigris and Euphrates, their headwaters are up here somewhere. So some people have theorized that the headwaters for the Gihon might have, might have been the river that, that would have gone down what's now the Red Sea, which didn't exist then. The Pishon, or uh, would it might have been this river that they found, the antique riverbed that leads across Arabia. 
Tigris and Euphrates may originally have had their, their sources here. Now, the rivers don't flow that way now because all of this was changed with the geographical interruption that led to the Great Rift Valley. It's possible that all four of these rivers could have had headwaters somewhere around here, around what is now Israel. Interesting theory. We don't have any proof. Just fun. Okay? Otherwise, we don't know for sure where the Garden of Eden. I've always found it fascinating that Scripture seems to go to great length to try to explain to us where it was, and yet we don't know. Um, because it talks about the headwaters of the four rivers, and the fact that the Pishon River crosses through the land of Havilah, which has uh, excellent gold and, and sapphires and other uh, onyx and other minerals, and you know, it gives us quite a bit of description. But the geology and geography has completely changed since those ancient times, so we don't know for sure. Interesting? Yes. Yes. Um, okay. Let's talk now a little bit about the flood. The, um, as I said earlier, one way to look at the first 11 chapters of Genesis is that there are two major events, <coughs> creation and then the fall, and then everything that happens after the fall really is, an, is a result of the fall. Because right after the fall, when Adam and Eve you know, have sons, Cain killed Abel. And then you have a split there because they have another son named Seth. Seth becomes the, the uh, father, you know, I mean, it's uh, Adam's son, but becomes the father of a line of righteous peoples that lead to Noah. Cain becomes the father of a line that apparently is not very good because it leads to Lamech, for instance, who killed the man who offended him and threatens to kill anybody who gives him a hard time. I mean, he's a rough character. And there's a, there's a strange, one of the strangest passages in Scripture in Genesis. It talks about the sons of God married the daughters of men and had children. And you're going, what the heck is that all about? Some people have said it means that, that angels married women and bore these demigods. There were giants in the world in those days. Some have said that it meant that there were kingly people, you know, the descendants of who, kings of people, who married commoners, that's the sons of God, the king, the divine king kind of thing, and ordinary people. The best description, I believe, is the recognition that by that time there had been a division between the line of Seth, where, who were those that were more, who sought to follow God more closely, and the line of Cain, who had been cursed, and that we see the evidence of in Lamech, his descendant, who was a horrible guy. And that, in fact, what happened is they were supposed to be separate, and it's, they started intermarrying. And God is, was offended by the fact that they were doing that. The sons of God, meaning the, the line of people from Seth that were supposed to be godly. The daughters of men, meaning the line of, um, from Cain that were more earthly and more, um, you know, not as godly. So, it's right after the intermarrying of the sons of God and the daughters of men that we end up with description of that all of humanity had gotten so bad that the God sends the flood. And here we have Genesis 6. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. This happens right after the sons of God and daughters of men thing. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I am going to put an end to all people. For the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. Again, all this detail that you get, like the detail of the description of the Garden of Eden. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. Cubits about a foot and a half, by the way. Um, make a roof for it, leaving below the roof and open, opening one cubit high all around. Put a door on the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks. I'm going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature that has breath of life in it, everything on earth will perish, but I will establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. The story of the flood. And there are ancient Babylonian parallels, the Gilgamesh epic, the last part of the Atrahasis epic. Um, very little has captured the human imagination more than this kind of image. I mean, we've got artwork for, you know, 
several thousand years trying to picture what it would have been like for these animals to gather and enter into the ark. Okay, you, Mexico loved this thing. You can't go anywhere they have the little sculptures or the paintings or the whatever without finding some evidence of, of Noah and the ark and all the animals. Okay, um, you even get modern expressions of it. This is a supposedly full-size ark that a Dutch man named John Huber has built and 3,000 tourists a day are already coming to it. It's not even finished yet. Okay, and there are other places. There's somebody is building a, a set, another Holy Land kind of site, and they're going to have a full size ark. This one's supposed to be like like two thirds size. I don't think it's full size, uh, but it's big. <laughs> um, there's this fascination with this thing. So then we come to the actual flood. Happens. It floods for 150 days, and then it says God remembered Noah, and then it recedes for 150 days, and Noah sends out birds that come back, and then he sends out other birds, and they stay gone, so he knows it's okay, and they open the ark. Then God said to Noah, come out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and their wives, bring out every kind of living creature that is with you, the birds, the animals, all the creatures that move along the ground, so they can multiply on the earth and be fruitful and increase in number on it. So Noah came out together with his sons and his wife and his sons' wives. Uh, then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and taking some of all the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. By the way, he talks about two of every kind, but then there's certain kind of animals, particularly because of sacrifice, that there were seven of them taken. That's why you can sacrifice clean animals without... Uh, you've probably seen the Gary Larson cartoon. It's Noah, and it's like this. there's this blood there, and there's this carcass, and, and it's a unicorn. You know, you can tell it's a unicorn laying there dead. He goes, all right, all carnivores, stay on the lower level from now on, you know, kind of thing. So, we lost the unicorns there in the ark. Uh, so, uh, the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood, and never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done, as long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. Then God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. God had a covenant with Adam and Eve. The second covenant of the Old Testament is the covenant with Noah and his descendants. It was a covenant not to destroy the earth, to bless them, that they would, would multiply and replenish the earth. Um, and in fact... Some of the other instructions, which go on from here for Noah, became known as the Noahide Code. We talked about this under uh, Old Testament theology last term. The Noahide Code is, is seen by Jews as being the instructions for Gentiles. That Gentiles will be righteous if they follow the, the uh, law given to Noah, whereas the Jews have the much more specific and demanding law that was given to Moses. But Jews considered... Gentiles righteous if they follow the Noahide code. All right, I won't get into all the detail of that, but it's interesting. Um, again, we said this was the traditional Garden of Eden. Up here is Mount Ararat. Mount Ararat is the traditional site where the Garden, of, uh, where the Ark was expected to have, or thought to have, come to rest, and where uh, Noah and his family came out from, and then came south and toward warmer weather because Ararat is actually snow-covered part of the year, so it's kind of cold up there. For many, many, many years, Ararat, it's in a very remote area, and it was not accessible for political reasons. They've gotten to be more lenient about that now. It's in, it's in Turkey, modern-day Turkey. And in fact, there are scholars who say, archaeologists and, and fortune hunters and others, who say they have found Noah's Ark. This is a formation on Mount Ararat, which they say is petrified wood. And they have samples of it, and this is supposed to be the outline of the hull that is left. That's what they claim. It's interesting. It's not necessary. I had a friend of mine who was very involved in this whole search for Noah's Ark thing, and he was supporting it financially. He was hoping to go on one of the expeditions. He worked for a Christian organization I knew and did some consulting with. And he said, oh, this is going to be like the greatest thing since Jesus is going to be one. And I said, finally, one time, okay, it's interesting. It really is. But why are you this excited about it? And he said, because if we can prove this is Noah's Ark, millions of people will come to believe in God and believe in Jesus. And I went, you know, they won't. Jesus actually said, even if somebody came back from the dead to tell them, they would not believe. He said that in the story about, you know, Lazarus and the rich man, and the rich man who's in hell says, we'll send Lazarus, who's in heaven with the <coughs> Father Abraham, to my brothers and tell them 
so that they won't end up in this terrible place where I am. And uh, Jesus telling the story as Abraham say, no, they have, they have uh, Moses and the prophets to teach them. If they won't listen to them, then even if a dead man came back to tell them, they wouldn't listen. Finding Noah's Ark is not going to convert people to salvation. It's interesting, but um, from there, this is where the split happened. You had Cain and Abel. Cain, of course, killed Abel. Those were the first sons. From Cain, there then were three generations to Lamech, who was the real hard-nosed, I killed one guy for offending me, and I'll kill anybody else who does. Um, and then Seth, who was the son who came later, after eight generations, you have Noah, and the event we just read about. Noah's three sons are Shem, who is the father of the Semites. I really need to find out sometime why it's not Shemites, but, you know, they did make those changes. But Shem is the father of the Semites. Ham is the father of the Canaanites and the African people. Uh, Jephthah, or, or Japheth, I'm sorry, is supposed to be the father of the northern, lighter-skinned peoples. And these were the generations of the sons of Noah. Okay, now, with the three sons of Noah, there is again a description that is a palistrophe. We have in uh, 610, introduction of Noah's three sons. 618 is the declaration of God's covenant with Noah and the promise to destroy the earth with a flood. It's basically, you're my guy Noah, and I'm going to save you if you'll listen to me, but I'm going to destroy everybody else. This was the, the start of the Noah covenant. Then the command that they should take food on the ark, and then Noah and his family enter the ark, and then the flood comes. Then the palestrope backs up, and each one of these is a parallel. Noah and his family come out of the ark. All right, they've gone on here, 7 1, they come out of the ark. They're commanded not to eat blood. Here they were commanded to take food to eat. Then there is the covenant reestablished with Noah with a promise not to destroy the earth with a flood, whereas the first line, the parallel, was, was a covenant with Noah and the promise to destroy all the earth with a flood. And then a restatement of Noah's three sons, which were introduced three chapters earlier. There's this palestrope. It goes out, and then it comes back. Very intentional structure in the Hebrew language there. Then, within this middle section, this uh, flood on the earth, that also is structured as a palestrophe. The Lord shuts the door and it rains for 40 days and nights. The waters increase until the mountains are covered. There's 150 days that the waters prevail. Then God remembers Noah. Then there's 150 days that the waters abate. You see the parallel. Then the waters decrease until the mountains become visible because the mountains have been covered earlier. Then at the end of 40 more days, Noah opens the window. <coughs> okay. It goes out and it comes back. The structure of the palestrophe. But you didn't know about this stuff, did you? Uh, very intentional structure in the Hebrews. The Hebrews were very poetic writers. I've got five minutes to do the last section, which is the table of nations and Babel. Um, this is where the descendants of the three sons of, of Noah are introduced, and then we find out what happens to them. This is the account of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, Noah's sons, who themselves had sons after the flood. And then we go through passages, 30 verses, 31 verses, that introduce the specific lines of descendants, the genealogies of the Japhethites, the Hamites, and the Semites. Then it says, these are the clans of Noah's sons, according to their descent of descent, their lines of descent, within their nations. From these the nations spread out over the earth after the flood. Now the whole, chapter 11, now the whole world had one language and common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. Now, one thing you do need to know. Each of the people had their own, oh, where is it? They had one language and common speech, but it defines, it identifies the people as having their own nations and own languages, you know, in one place. I don't have that verse on here. Um, so the suggestion is, that they did have their own languages, but they all spoke a common language as well, which was very much the case in the in New Testament times. You know, we talked about that, that when we talked about the fullness of time. Everybody spoke their own language, but also everybody spoke Greek because of Alexander the Great. That appears to have been the situation here, because we have verses, just a few verses apart, that say, you know, they each separated according to their nations and their own languages, and then it says they had one common language. So the suggestion is everybody spoke at least two. Then we have, so this is the table of nations, because it, it outlines um, where 
you know, where the, the various descendants, where all of the various groups of people throughout this part of the world came from after the flood. Then the Tower of Babel, starting with the last verse we used. Now the whole earth had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they founded a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let us make bricks and make them thoroughly. We're back down in Mesopotamia now, by the way. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens, so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Pride was behind this. Make a name for ourselves. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that they were building. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. <clears throat> so the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. It's important to note that the word Babel or Babel means the gate of God. So the fact that they named their city Babel, the Bab is, uh, means gate. In that, uh, for instance, in uh, Baha'i, the sort of John the Baptist of the Baha'i, the forerunner, the one who opened the way for the coming of the, of the, the Baha'i version of the Messiah, was called the Bab, the gate. So Bab El means the gate of God. The suggestion was that they were doing it not only for their own benefit, but they thought that they would be like God. There's that idea of being like God again. This, probably second only to the Noah's Ark, has captured the imagination in art for ever. All right? There are, there are many, many different paintings, many different ideas about what the Tower of Babel might have looked like. Again, we are talking here near Babylon, is the traditional belief that's where the Tower of Babel was. In that part of the world, they had a regular um, type of tower that they built that's called a ziggurat, or a stepped pyramid, is sometimes re referred to. It looked like this. They didn't have arches. They didn't have some of the modern building techniques, many of which the Romans invented, for instance. But they did have the ability to build slanting walls, and they would build up a level, and then flatten it off and step in and build up a level and flatten it off and step in and build up a level. So they could go pretty high with some of these things. They would use buttresses sometimes to maintain, you know, maintain support structure. These ziggurats, we have found them from as, uh, the ruins of them from, 21, from the 21st century BC, meaning over 4,000 years old. Um, in fact, this one is the ziggurat of Ur. This is not a drawing. This is a photograph. The ziggurat of Ur, which is, you noticed on that, Ur is a little further south from Babylon. This was found uh, in the early 20th century intact. It was covered in sand. They uncovered it and they sort of refaced it, but the ziggurat itself was there. And then Saddam Hussein, because this is in modern day Iraq, Saddam Hussein had it really cleaned up, but it's basically just with, a, with some more facing stones on it. It's the same structure that's been there for over 4,000 years. Just so that you know that this is a photograph, there's a military airplane flying over it. If you go online and you look up the ziggurat of Ur, you can see American soldiers climbing up these steps when we invaded Iraq. Okay? Um, so these structures, it's very likely that this would have been what the Tower of Babel would have been. They would have started with a huge base and done the step pyramid thing, the idea that they're going to build the Tower of all towers, the gate of God, and they will be like gods themselves. And God chose to confuse their language, and that's where we get the word Babel. You know, I couldn't understand anything, it was just babbling. Okay. Um, the later on, the barbarians. Uh, when, in later times, when they were, the Romans would call, talk to people, talk to people as being barbarians, it means they didn't speak Greek or Latin. And barbarian is from the same root of Babel, okay? Meaning they just babbled. They didn't have any intelligible language, which, which would have been either Greek or Latin. Um, so, the four great events we've talked about: creation, fall, the flood, and the Tower of Babel. Next. We get from Noah through Shem, of course Ham and Japheth, 
Ham becomes the, uh, his descendants are Canaan. From Shem, after eight generations, we come to Abraham. Next week, we pick up the end of chapter 11, start of chapter 12, the story of Abraham. And for the next, you know, from end of chapter 11 through chapter 50, we will look at the story of the patriarchs. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all of Jacob's sons, but especially one of them, Joseph. Up until the time that they are in Egypt. I've gone over only three minutes. Any questions or comments about any of that? Thank you.